Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, here on our final day at HLTH, um, wanted to uh, welcome everybody to our booths. Um, come on in. We're going to have a uh, short and sweet little discussion around uh, prior auth. That's today's topic, prior auth. Uh, for those who didn't know, there, you know, CMS introduced a rule uh, um, a few months ago uh, called the Advancing Interoperability and Improving Prior Authorization Process Rule. Uh, unfortunately, they did not give it a nickname, so I go with the whole name every time I say it, which is not easy. It doesn't really roll off the tongue. But in any case, that was a very important rule, and uh, it, has, it begs a lot of questions, especially in the world we're living right now and this kind of opportunity we have with uh, it's sort of the evolution of the industry, the movement of data, the advancement of interoperability, leads to a number of questions around, well, if we are moving in this direction and, and given that, that rule, what, what does the future hold? What are the changes we should all be looking at? Is it, is it about the data? Is, is it about the workflows? Is it something else? Is it all of the above? Uh, and that's what we're going to discuss today. Uh, we're going to have a little fun panel. Um, there are three of us here today from uh, the team. We have Sergio Wagner, uh, our Chief Strategy Officer. Derek Plansky, our SVP of Product Strategy, and myself, SVP of um, uh, Corporate Development, Strategy and Corporate Development. Um, and guys, why don't we just go ahead and open up? Let me let's let's first start with the rule itself. Can you tell us a little bit about this this new rule that uh, CMS has proposed? So they've basically CMS has come out and proposed that. Anyone on Medicare, uh, any of the Medicare Advantage plans and so forth are responsible for actually providing and supporting prior auth um, according to the FHIR APIs and the Da Vinci, <coughs> excuse me, the Da Vinci Group's implementation guides. Make sure I'm holding my mic properly here. Um, so there's a lot of uh, technical underpinnings of all of that to make sure that the transactions are made available, but the key thing is that they're mandating use of a particular standard um, and explicitly forbidding a previous standard, the, the X12 um, data standards around uh, a number of the payer transactions. They're actually requiring that they use this new Firebase DaVinci interoperability piece, the burden reduction flow, which is a three-step process. Um, so there's, <clears throat> there's a lot of other chapter and verse things behind that, but the, the most interesting thing related to prior auth is that it's actually mandated and anyone from a Medicaid or Medicare program is obligated to participate in this. What, what about the commercials? Are the commercials obligated to pay? It's a CMS rule, so I imagine not. Not, no. Yeah. So they, the commercials do tend to follow what happens from CMS, but there's no, they don't have the legislative authority to mandate how the commercials do things, but hopefully, and. We do know that some of the commercials are already looking at those particular standards. They've been part of the Da Vinci process, but they they don't have to. See, but I'll be the controversial one here. So isn't that part of the problem? I mean, when we introduced prior auth, it became a $25 billion behemoth. It was actually originally set to control cost and make sure that people were getting the right care at the right time. It sort of morphed into this, yeah, let's make sure that people get the right care at the right time, but let's also make sure that people are going to an in-network provider. So it became more of a cost-cutting measure or cost management measure than anything else. So I actually like the topic, is it a workflow or is it a data? Because it's a little bit of both, I think. So this makes perfect sense in, in the sense that you, I think you've started getting into the, the notion that I was first thinking about. That a rule typically implies that we're facing challenges and we need to move forward in a particular manner, a particular direction. So what are the challenges? I think you started getting to it there, Sergio, when you said that it started out with this more noble purpose, or at least noble sounding purpose, and it has been utilized for more than that. And I, I bet there's even more if you can, as you unwrap that, un as you unpeel that onion. But yeah. uh, what yeah, are the challenges I mean, you see? To me, the challenges are, I mean, having come from a health healthcare system prior, you know, prior to this life, right? It's, the challenges are we want to make sure that, yeah, we started with the idea of doing the right thing and making sure the patients are getting adequate care at the, you know, at the proper time. But it also became a, a vehicle by which an organization could also use it to ensure that let's make sure that the patient is eligible. Let's make sure that they are going from an in-network provider to a contracted entity. And therefore, it actually creates a bit of a disalignment in terms of incentives because good idea, good intent, poor execution, not sure. 
Um, now with the new CMS rule, basically CMS is saying like, this is going to be the new highway by which we are doing this. And therein lies, uh, just like with all of Qhins and Tefka and what's coming, a pretty interesting opportunity. But it is an opportunity. It's us. It's for for us. And when I say us, I mean the entire healthcare ecosystem to take advantage of it and and do something meaningful with it, or more of the same. Derek, how would you add to that? Particularly, I'd love to hear from the perspective of the technology challenges, the product challenges. So as you've, as you've, I know, spent a lot of time deep diving into those pathways that exist today. Yeah, there, that's lots of fun. Um, <laughs> when you're a data geek looking into the this mechanics, and actually, most of the problems are problems of inertia. Um, the the systems that the payers have, have they, they're still using claims automation or claims processing systems, some of which are mainframes still running COBOL. Come on, it's 2023 now. Um, and it's sad. There, and there are certainly more modern and uh, well-implemented solutions out there, but they themselves are not consistently implemented. And there are always these other competing priorities. And so there needed to be some sort of forcing function to actually make the organizations actually move forward with this as opposed to, oh yeah, we'll get to it when we need to. Even though there's an immense amount of pain inside the organizations, the payer organizations, um, they have huge numbers of you know, staff that are receiving faxes still. Again, we thought we'd solve that problem, haha. -ha. Um, <laughs> no, it's still prior auth is largely done via fax. So even with regard to you know, all the other technology pieces that we've tried to do to solve that, whether it's direct messaging, these interoperability pieces, uh, even just the transacting in X12, um, we are still you know, sending a huge number of faxes. We're having people manually adjudicate things, um, faxing information back and forth. And it's not perfect, but the, the Da Vinci workflow that folks have tried to implement is at least a reasonable step forward to Let's get something flowing, and then let's iterate and repeat and see if we can refine it over time. Well, actually, that's a perfect segue. So then looking forward, okay, between the rule and the work that the Da Vinci community has, you know, invested, has invested in to get us to these new workflows, do we have any starting point, any, anything to, that we know we can look forward to? Any success stories? Any indications that, yeah, this path forward is going to yield a better outcome? Uh, from the perspective of efficiency and and all the other all the other sort of things that are plaguing us, you know, you know, per your descriptions before. I, I mean, I don't know. I'm I'm the eternal optimist in the body of a cynist. I, I, I'm cynical by nature, but I, I I aim for the best. I I think that you know one of the things that the the healthcare revolution has taught us is that. Yeah, if you would have asked me 10 years ago when I was at Stanford Health that today we would be willingly and openly sharing data for treatment purpose uh, from uh, Stanford to Kaiser to Sutter, I, I would have said, you're, you're crazy. It's not going to happen. Yet here we are, right? We are largely have more or less sold access to data um, as it relates to treatment. I think that there is a huge opportunity for any organization that is vertically integrated, that is taking total risk. Uh, because it ultimately has all of the alignments in needed that are in place for this to be a success. And I agree with Derek. I mean, let's get implemented something now and let's, let's show quick wins. But I do think that a very good place to start is for organizations that are vertically integrated because they can actually have the path to quickest set of success. So I agree completely with that. Um, from a quick win perspective, I think that the so originally there were the X12 standards, which were you know predate HL7 because you know it was more important to get paid than to have clinical data flowing, which which makes sense. Um, but the the Da Vinci piece, there's one piece, the the first step in the three step tango associated with the uh, benefits. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, burden reduction use case or implementation guide is this thing called CRD, or Coverage Requirements Determination. And that doesn't exist, or didn't exist in the old legacy standards. It's basically the simple question of, do I need to do a prior auth or not? And you don't need to use complex logic or clinical logic for most of that. It should be something that's relatively straightforward to implement, even as the more complex, oh, what clinical data do I need to use for you know this MRI with contrast, without contrast, or this particular surgical procedure or whatever. 
those parts are complicated and we're going to have to work those out and there's there's some you know heavy lifting associated with that but this first step of do i even need to do this um we're hoping that we can get some exchange on that in you know, maybe this quarter or next quarter uh, associated with that because then at least you've got data flowing and at least then you know do i need to at least follow up because providers are just asking for prior auth for everything because they don't know there's no quick way to answer that question. So I'm, I'm optimistic about that piece of it. All right, so this, okay, so this is, this is, you guys paint a very good optimistic picture. So I'm going to bring us down a little bit into reality a little bit. So somewhere, hopefully somewhere between being totally cynical and being totally optimistic, being an implementer type of guy myself, I have to ask this question. Prior off is already happening now. Did you say it was like a $25 billion market? Some, some number, right? It's a huge, huge market. Everybody is doing it all the time right now. We're talking about a new set of workflows on the heels of a rule that have, we have a couple of years. The rule doesn't come into final effect until early 2026, if I recall, right? That's some implementation day. So you have a little, a little bit, of, a little bit of, that's a little bit of time from the perspective of IT development, right? But there's a lot that's already happening right now. So what's the balance? How do, you, how do you as an organization get from here to there where you're in the, new, in the new sort of paradigm, not dropping the ball on privacy, not dropping the ball on kind of your existing processes? What's a way to, for a person to think about the pathway to get to a bet, you know, more modern architecture? So let's start with the... Um Start with the optimistical part. Let's assume that you know no one drops the ball on privacy and all of that stuff. Let's assume that. Now let's go to the cynical part, right? The cynical part tells you that, based on what Derek said, I th I think that that is the that is a good marriage between the technical workflow and the data workflow, and that the reality is that if we can actually set the alignment to say, hey, listen, what actually needs an auth versus what doesn't need an auth, then we can have the follow up conversation. But it, it, it really all boils down to, look, sharing data was not a technical issue, right? I mean, sharing data was more of a, I don't want to share data because it's an asset. And well, today it's not an asset. We should do the right thing and share data with other people. It, it's, it really isn't a technical, there's really smart people here in the room and here at this conference. So we can't figure it out. So it's a question of what are the properly aligned incentives in that payers want data, providers want to get paid, and if you create an aligned incentives in which there is a technical infrastructure to which this process is flow through, and then I, I as a provider know what needs and doesn't need an auth, and then the payers need the information, because we're all sharing data now. I mean, data, is, to his point, is broadly accessible. So it's how to properly align the incentives so that we can do that. And that's the, the, the cynic part is, that's the hardest piece, right? Because this is the only market in which Listen, guys, we're all here to solve interoperability, reduce uh, you know, the, the, GD spend, the GD, uh, GDP of 18% that we spend as a country and have questionable outcomes. If we succeed in this, the TAM gets smaller. So insofar as someone wins, someone will lose. And the sooner that we come to grips with that reality, the, you know, we, the better off we're going to be. So it's, to me, it's all about align incentives and align incentives flow through the economy of it all. Someone will win, someone will lose, and insofar as, I mean, just think about this, right? I mean, if we actually solve the, the crux of interoperability, more specifically, uh, this $25 billion problem for prior auth, we essentially will take some money out of that table, so someone will lose. And that's w that's a cynical. W wouldn't you argue some of that money really is going to be directed to something else? We have bigger problems in value-based yeah, care, for example, an which now? we don't go after. <laughs> it's me. We should have renamed this. Not about data and workflow. It's about optimist or, or skeptic, right? That's what we should have named this this work session. Maybe. But I, I agree. I ho we'd, we'd hope that the the pie where we spend all this money right now, just trying to do something which, for the most part, a lot of it can be automated. We spend it on the ability to just go after risk more meaningfully and actually improve improve the population, uh, the the health of populations, right? Now, what about your perspective there? I love to hear. Like, we we have a plane that's flying, man, and we're trying to rebuild it. Like, how would you think about the this, the challenge that uh, organizations have to, you know, face? Well, actually, I was going to come in and the being the skeptic now for a second, <laughs> like swapping hats man. for fun, um, because the incentives aren't aligned. Because in the absence of having this, people have stepped in and seized an opportunity and created fragmented platforms out there 
and you know we're once again creating stovepipes, and some of those are very lucrative things for, say, some EMR companies. It's more so the EMR companies, um, and so they will look at this requirement from the government saying, okay, I have to turn this on, but I'm only going to turn it on for the bare minimum because it's, you know, eating into a market share, you know, to what Sergio was saying about, you know, the pie will shrink, you know, ideally it should shrink, you know, if we put on what's best for the country kind of perspective, we spend way too much money on healthcare for the outcomes we get. Even if we got great outcomes for the money we spend, we probably still spend too much money given all the other challenges. But not solving the world's problems, we're solving, you know, prior auth here. Um, it, it's just going to be interesting, and I think it's going to be very messy. Like, there'll be success, there'll be little bright spots of success, and we'll definitely try and champion and grow those, but there are going to be some really messy things on the boundaries, and it's just going to be, and it's going to be interesting. So let me ask you guys this. <clears throat> And now I, I will finally put on a skeptic hat on, right? Having always been in roles where I'm trying to champion the cause of smaller companies. I think about this shrinking pie opportunity to make healthcare more efficient. The organizations which tend to lose the most are always the smallest ones, the little guys. How do, how do you think about this from the perspective of the smaller organizations embracing a change now um, in how they, you know, how they might do prior auth. How much should they do? How much should they not do? Like, how, how do you think about that to get to a place where, you know, we're not squeezing them out of the equation. That's not the way that pie is shrinking. Well, I'll, I'll give you the point of view from the, the market, right? Because at, at the end of the day, where we are having a healthcare conversation and we're all are talking about reducing the healthcare spend, we are in a very capitalistic society and sometimes in... In, in crisis, there lies opportunity. So I, I do think that ultimately and fundamentally somebody will win and somebody will lose. I don't necessarily agree that it will be the smaller guy. And I'm talking, I'm wearing purely the, the, the hat of uh, an entrepreneur that, that's running a smaller company versus you know a sitting incumbent, right? I, I think that it's going to be about understanding, understanding the market, understanding the problem and being thoughtful and being disciplined in terms of executing towards solving a problem because I do think that in a, in a free market the sometimes the best solution doesn't always win but the best position won so if you have a good enough solution that's well positioned ie having the right partnerships I, I think you have as a smaller company a, a shot at winning number one and number two insofar as a smaller company wins sometimes it ultimately will level the playing field Right? I mean, look at all of these lab networks that exist, right? I mean, lab networks that exist today in these bi-directional or two-sided marketplaces, right? Allow these smaller players to go head-to-head -head with, you know, the big three. So I, 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 think, in, I think in those terms, and, and I think that while skepticism is warranted, um, it isn't necessarily a death sentence, but it's also an opportunity in so which some will thrive and some will not. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase a part of that. So, so what I'm hearing you say is that the small guy doesn't necessarily lose. They have to think about what assets they either utilize or partner for and put those together intelligently in a disciplined manner. I like that phrase. So that they can actually succeed par with the, with the bigger players, so to speak. All right. That makes, that hire makes you sense. to sort of rephrase my statements. They sound better when you say them. I thought that is why you hired me. <laughs> It's the end of the conference, folks. We're very tired. <laughs> Go ahead, Derek. What, do you, what is your what do, uh, what do you think about this? Do you agree? Something else you'd add on top? You know, generally, the incumbent is you know has all the advantages, but change always happens on the periphery. So I think that the smaller companies, if they ruthlessly prioritize, and I do mean you know just focus on the value creation, simplification, um, you know the workflows that exist. Um, that's how they ultimately succeed and are able to participate and just, you know, dance around the footsteps of the elephants. Um, because there are going to be larger things going on, you know, regulatorily, you've got, you know, CMS put this out there as an attempt to be a forcing function and also a playfield leveling function so that um, if these standards exist, um, you know, standardization allows, you know, it democratizes access which is ultimately we want to provide. 
And as long as somebody on the larger side is making sure that the larger players are behaving appropriately, um, the smaller ones, it's not guaranteed that they'll be successful, but they at least should have a fair shot if they you know, stay focused on return, uh, simplification, and solving specific problems in the priority order that they determine. All right. Okay. So that makes perfect sense. And I'll, you know, I'll point out, and you know, this is something we've all had experience with over the last 20 years, the process of standardization is a process of enabling everybody to play in a level playing field, whether that part player is large, small, aiming to go from small to large, aiming to just participate in a particular market. There are lots of mom and pop shops which are happy to be very comfortable. And, then, and even, you know, there's a whole gamut of organizations with different strategies. Leveling this playing field through standardization really enables them to focus the, on the rest of the business if they get it right. All right, we're almost at the end of our like structured time. So let me ask you guys a qu one question. Let's, go, let's bring it back to our original title. So what do you think? Is this a data problem? Is it a workflow problem? Coming right back to prior auth and this, this migration, this move, and this, the rule, how should, how should people be thinking about what their strategy, the key components of their strategy as they move there? I'll answer your question. In my view take, it's a workflow pro problem through which data was the unwilling capture. So data was the, uh, uh, what's the, word? the probably the, the unintended victim. The unintended victim. Well said. It was the unintended victim that over time it became more valuable and powerful and it just became a, a broader and bigger commoditized asset. But I, I do fundamentally think it's a workflow and an alignment issue. Derek, what about you? You agree or you take a different position? I, I do tend to agree. I unfortunately want to split the difference and say it's really both because you can't have one without the other. But, but I would say it's a workflow first. All right, good, terrific, well, great. We actually came to a, an actual answer on, uh, on, on the question. All right, right, let's. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left. Let's uh, see if there's anybody in the audience who wants to ask questions, weigh in. Go ahead. Oh, Sharice, please. First of all, I'm going to not straddle the fence. It is a workflow problem for several reasons, um, but I have a question for you guys. So, you know, prior auth is one of those things that really did clog up the system. Um, and I think, it is my opinion, that payers um, now see that they can't continue to clog up the system and burn out doctors and stuff with the prior off nonsense. Um, because a fisherman always sees another fisherman coming. And if you think about how the Amazons of the world are attacking health and making health care more affordable to people, you'd be a fool to be a payer and say, we're going to continue to be a problem to patients and think we're going to function in that way. So in September... United Healthcare started removing pre-offs for a set of their um, procedures. And I said, I really think that's a preemptive way because they know it, they're a problem right now and they need to be able to still be a, an option for patients um, if they're competing against the Amazons of the world. Um, so I think it's a workflow issue. It is not convenient for them. And the incentivized care and things, you can't pay people to care. Um, so I think they see that and understand that. That being said, with the pre -offs, um, prior offs being removed for some procedures for um, United Healthcare, do you think that'll be a continued trend? And do you think we're going to eventually see the end of all these overreach pre -offs? I think so. And if you look at if you look at what's happened, I mean, United was probably the the first one to vertically integrate. Uh, and then, you know, others followed, you know, Aetna CBS and Humana, etc. So, I, I, yeah, I do violently agree with what you're saying. I think that there is, this is a, a, a very specific move to say there's no real reason, quote unquote, to actually have these processes in place because, let's see, if you're, in, if you're a Medicaid provider, you're always going to pay Medicaid rates. It doesn't matter if it was authorized or not. Right, and if it's a commercial member, the commercial member could get balance bailed, and then it'll go through the UN process and, and get taken care of. So I completely agree with your notion. I don't have much to add. I've not my area of expertise, but it makes sense. All right. Do we have? Uh, I think we have time for maybe one more question here on stage, and of course, all of us are available after. Anybody else have a question? No. All right. All right. Then let's. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for spending some time on talking through prior auth. And, uh
appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great rest of the conference, everybody.